All right. So these microbes are found in the water, the soil, the air, the plants, animals. And so what are some of those microbes that are beneficial for living? Who can name at least one? As a nurse, you should be able to name at least one. So a really common one that we use that helps us in our digestive tract. That's it. So like uh, probiotics that are found in uh, yogurts, those are in our digestive tract naturally, right? So those can help us with certain things. So some of these microbes can help prevent illness and other ones can actually cause illness or exposed to them. So our labs use a variety of different types of methods to try to control the microbes or reduce the number of them so they're not as harmful. It's not always possible to remove them all. So if we can control them at least, that can help us. All right, so control is a never ending process in the lab environment and also in different industries, especially the food industry, because if we don't control the microbes in that industry, then it can lead to things like food poisoning and death. Um, and so, you know, this is why they always tell you to cook things to a certain temperature. It's going to be left out over a certain period of time. You have to cool it down and refrigerate it. Because otherwise, we're giving the opportune uh, growth um, environment for some of these microbes to grow and uh, to duplicate or increase. So control is achieved through physical, chemical agents, chemical methods, chemical agents, or a combination of both. And the control methods really refer to the practices and the agents that are used to destroy the microbes on surfaces. Uh, so that could be like instruments, instruments that we use in the hospital, uh, laboratory surfaces, educational facilities. So two main ways to go up microbial control. One is going to be chemical and one is going to be physical. So what do you think is the difference? Well, we all got laryngitis too. What do you think is the difference between the chemical and the physical methods? How many of you read these chapters? You must know something, nurse. Well, chemical is something that, that we make up and environmental is, is natural. Is natural disinfectant. Okay, you have to I disinfect have to your really nurses. Be... Go ahead, sorry. No, I mean, environmental is like the heat, the warmth from the environment and and the um, uh, chemical is the ones that we make up, the PPI wipes, the hand solution. <clears throat> okay, because we can't set our nurse's station on fire, right? But we can remove a lot of the chemicals if we use those antibacterial wipes and things like that. So chemical agents include a variety of disinfectants that are going to help reduce or inhibit bacteria. And that can work on a variety of different services. Depending on what the chemical is, on what you're trying to destroy, and um, also you can use certain chemicals on certain things. If you have something like a couch that has um, like microfiber and stuff in it, it's going to help some of that microfiber, but if it's cloth, it's going to absorb more things than a flat, hard surface. So let's say you have a client that has like, um, some sort of infectious process, let's say varicella, and you know it's a small child and slobbering on that animal. There's only going to be so many ways that you'd be able to clean that stuffed animal. You want to be able to take that and give it to another child to use because you might not be able to disinfect it or sterilize it properly instead of all that growth that's in there, right? You may be able to reduce it, but not totally get rid of it. Go oh, yeah. Um, some agents can lay for a very long time, and as long as they're with it, um, they are infectious, and other agents can be drugs. If you put a little moisture to them, they can reactivate. So they have 
killing or eliminating microbes. Now, if we want to completely eliminate a microbe, of a microbe, then we want to use a chemical agent because that's only going to reduce. If we want to completely get rid of it or eliminate it, we have to use a process known as sterilization. Scrubbing. Chemical methods for control of microbial growth. And this is Miss Loesch, you going in and out. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me like put my sound, headset on. sound real muffled, then it get loud again. Let me put my headset on. What are you even thinking? What page are we on? I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, I don't go by page. 138 and 139. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. It's right from your book. And the slides may not match up because I'm lousy at clicking the slides. If the material matches your book. Okay, how's that? Is that any better? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so we were talking about chemical agents, and what I said about chemical agents is they help reduce spore and growth, but you can't it completely eliminate it. And the reason why is because we need a process known as sterilization to completely eliminate the growth. Now we're talking about physical methods. These are control the microbes using standard practices. We use these practices in the lab, in the hospital, some research facilities. And these, unlike chemical agents, are trying to completely eliminate the organism. So when we use a physical method, we're trying to completely eliminate it, not reduce it or All right, physical methods use techniques that result in the complete death of the microbe and usually involve some form of extreme temperature, such as heat. But some things we can just bag it up and throw it in the cold and it'll get rid of it. Other things we can put in really high heat and that will get rid of it. Several factors have to be considered before we decide which method is most appropriate. Factors that uh, need to be considered are what site are we treating? So the site or the item is going to determine the method of the treatment. And that's what I was just talking about. Like if you have a beanbag chair, you may not be able to sterilize it. You have to throw it out, right? But if you have like um, an electric, I mean, a scaffold or something like that from the surgical procedure, throw that in an autoclave or something like that and sterilize it. Sometimes um, we actually incinerate things as well. We burn it up. All right, so environmental conditions also are going to have an impact on the effectiveness. The microbe um, or the microbes, um, different ones grow in different types of environments. That has to also be considered. All right, so warm disinfectants generally are going to work better than cold ones. So that's just one example. Chemical agents also can perform better under some sort of acidic or alkaline condition. Items that are contaminated with things like feces, vomit, blood, and so on have to be cleaned before we disinfect or sterilize it. So you want to remove any of that feces, any of that vomit, anything that's on there first, and then you do the disinfectant or the sterilization process. Now, biofilms will prevent those chemicals from being able to penetrate into some areas of the microbe. Okay, so um, all of the layers of the vial films and physical methods have to be used before to be effective. So a biofilm is sort of a covering that is over the bacteria. Like if you go out onto the ocean and you grab a rock and you pick it up, it's going to have like a slimy surface on it. And that's a biofilm. And it's designed to help uh, protect bacteria that's growing there and to protect the cells that are underneath that bacteria. 
the density and the arrangement actually protects the cells within that colony and the surface that they're attached to. It also helps supply nutrients that are needed for growth of those cells. So that's the purpose of that biofilm. The sensibility of the organs also has to be considered. All right, so some um, organisms be resistant and some organisms are going to be susceptible, meaning that some can be degraded or broken down and others are going to be like, uh, who you think you are? I'm bigger than you. Come on, bring, bring me your best shot. But today, uh-uh, I'm going to win because I can resist whatever you're bringing to the table. This is the process of decreasing the antimicrobial presence in an area on a surface. And we use this to control the microbes. Sorry, my headset's having a problem here. Being special. I broke it. All right, decontamination is the reduction or the removal of chemical or biological agents so that they no longer when we decant, decontaminate, we do like a general cleaning on various surface areas done several times a day. So like when we were running the COVID centers, okay, one of the things that we would do is every morning go in and start off, we would decontaminate the entire room, wipe everything down with the wipes, the spray, all that stuff, mop the floors, all that. And then as you're going throughout the day, Every time someone comes in to get tested, you're going back and you're wiping the areas that they touched, where they sat, all those areas to make sure that we're continually, continually contaminating that area. And you see this same process used like in the emergency room when you change over. You might see this done in like um, centers where they do dialysis, between patients are wiping everything down, cleaning you know, all the equipment in between. All right, in the operating room, you have to have a more thorough decontamination because it's a sterile environment. And so we need to reduce the risk for someone to get sick or an infection during an operation. So once the person is discharged from the hospital, the room would be decontaminated, it would be wiped down with the solution, and we would get rid of the bacteria, the fungi, and the virus. However, in the operating room, going to sterilize as much stuff as we possibly can. The prerequisite for any decontamination is adequate pre-cleaning of the item to be decontaminated. So you can't have visible soiled stuff on whatever you're going to decontaminate. You're going to clean that first and then do the decontamination process. Because really, how many of you have ever seen like a um, housekeeper, how they take a dirty mop to the floor and they're trying to mop the floor and the water is so dirty and all they're doing is pushing the dirt from one area to another okay so first you have to sweep mop and i mean the way i was taught you can mop again so your first mopping process really is just that loose dirt come up a little bit and then you go back and you pick it all up so that is a process of your cleaning first of the soiled area, and then you're going back. It's the same thing, you know, you get feces on or something on your table or whatever. You're going to first remove it, right? You're not just going to take the wipe and wipe the feces off and then go back and rewipe it, right? You go back and rewipe the table, or you should. I hope you do. Um, again, once you've actually wiped the soiled area off, just to make sure that it's thoroughly clean. Right, so again, any um, organic material like feces, blue, soil, and can also be disinfectant, right? So we want to be sure that we're cleaning it properly. Actual physical removal of the microorganism by scrubbing is, is just as important as the antimicrobial effect of the disinfectant. Sometimes uh, microbes can be resistant. Okay, so um, physical and chemical methods are available. However, because we've constantly used uh, 
antibiotics and uh, antibiotics. There's a variety of both viruses, bacteria, protozoa, protozoans, and elements that have developed a mechanism that allows them to sort of fight off that method of control that we're using and be resistant to it. So they have a number of mechanisms that make them resistant to some, and in some cases, all antimicrobial agents. So you see this in people that have things like ERSL, um, MRSA, uh, VRE. These clients have a lot of resistance to drugs that treat these uh, diseases because their body has been able to develop that. And a lot of it comes from exposure, uh, constant exposure to it, improper use. So people will take a medication for three or four days, feel better, they stop taking it. And so they develop a resistance to that medication. It actually helps the virus or the bacteria develop that resistance. Resistance of microbes to the method of control varies depending on the microbe and the life stage that it is in. Resistance ranges from the least resistance organisms to those with the highest resistance. So our least resistant organisms are going to be things like the bacterial vegetative, vegetative cells, fungal spores, hyphae, yeast, envelope viruses, and protozoan trophozytes. Motor resistance is seen with fungal sexual spores, protozoan cysts, and some viruses, mostly naked ones. Some of the most resistant viruses include things like hepatitis B, polio, bacteria Pseudomonas, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and S. aureus, and also moderately resistant organisms. So, like with um, With the TB, sorry. With the TB, um, the treatment for that is usually going to be some sort of um, what we call um, heart therapy. It's um, a combination of antibiotics. They might be on three or sometimes four different medications here to fight this off because it can be so resistant. Okay, so it's um, antiviral. Let me look at it. If I didn't say it, I would know it. Don't get old. Highly active anti retroviral therapy. Right? And this is where we use a broad category of treatment regimens, usually three or more antiretroviral drugs. And this is for people who have TB, HIV. Um, we're trying to do the most that we can here to get rid of it so that it doesn't have the capacity to be resistant. The highest resistant is going to be demonstrated by bacterial endospores and prions. Now, those prions are things that you'll see. Um, they are actually in the brain. And you might see those with people that have like mad cow's disease, things of that nature. Uh, endospores are considered the most resistant microbial form when killed. Other non-pathogenic organisms are killed as well. So you might see these in like Jacob's crutch disease as well. All right, so the most susceptible is going to be the envelope viruses, your gram-positive bacteria, non-envelope viruses, your fungi, gram-negative bacteria, and your trophozoites. The most resistant are your protozoan cysts, your microbacteria, your bacterial endospores, and your prions. We just went through all this. Sorry, I'm terrible at moving the slides. All 
All right, what are these endospores? Anybody know? These are highly resistant structures and they're formed by vegetative bacterial cells and they form in an unfavorable environment. They um, are bacteria that have a two-phase life cycle, a vegetative state and an endospore state. And in the vegetative state, it's going to be metabolically active. So it's going to grow. All right. When metabolism is happening, it's growing. And in the endospore state, it's in a dormant state that allows the organism to withstand an extremely hostile condition, meaning it can grow, okay, in a condition where other things can. So it can grow things like high temperatures, including boiling. And it's resistant to most disinfectants, antibiotics, and even some radiation. These endospores can survive for thousands of years. So some examples are going to be Bacillus, Clostridium, Sporolo, Sporobacillus, Oscillospira, and Thermoactinomyces. These are some of the ones that can make the endospores. The cyst is another structure that some of these microorganisms can also form. And again, in these harsh, can, harsh conditions, the cysts are mostly going to be formed by the protozoans and some of the other eukaryotic microorganisms. Bacteria can also form that structure. The way that a cyst differs from an endospore is in the way that it's formed. So the chemical structure is more resistant um, to the environmental stresses, especially heat. Endospores can actually threaten your life, all right, because they can cause infections like tetanus, anthrax, and botulism. Enter the body through some sort of uh, either tear or break in the skin through inhalation or injection. And then they're going to go in the body. They're going to find some place, you know, because all these things have to grow in a reservoir. What does that mean? What is a reservoir? It has to be a favorable condition. So it's going to be a prime spot where these things like to grow. Good. All right. So um, that was a little bit about endospores, okay? Um, they're resistant, again, to look at the things on your screen that they're resistant to. So these are dangerous because if we can't kill them, then they can kill you. All right, what exactly is uh, sterilization? So this is when we're going to kill all forms of microbial life, even the most resistant. The spores, the prions are eliminated, right? And items that can be sterilized are going to be things like surfaces, equipment, uh, foods, medications, uh, cultures that we draw. This sterilization is going to be uh, through either the use of heat or some sort of chemical, sometimes radiation, sometimes filtration. And high heat is going to be the most common way that we uh, perform this sterilization. Filtration is also an effective method, and it can get rid of microbes either liquid or air. In the case of prions, the sterilization uses both chemical and physical to destroy them. And we do that through autoclave using the um, contaminated items, keeping them in broth. Sodium hydroxide, I believe, is what this chemical structure is. I would have to look it up though. I'm not it's been a long time since I looked at the chemical structures of the table. All right, so sterilization, it's used to kill all organisms, viruses, spores, and all forms of microbial life. Okay, so bacterial endospores and prions are going to be eliminated here. Again, I said surfaces, equipment, foods, 
medication culture it can be achieved through heat pressure chemicals radiation or filtration filtration is also effective because that is going to help remove the microbes from the liquid so examples of essential agents that can control the growth of microbes include your extremes heat and cold low temperatures can slow the growth and heat is a method for killing the microbe. Uh, defecation and dehydration. What does that mean? Anybody know? Well, desiccation, you should know. This is a nursing terminology. And it's a word for drying. So we're drying or dehydrating, right? When you dehydrate your vegetables, what do you or your fruit, what do you do? Can you say that again? When you dehydrate your fruit at home, what do you do to it? How is it dehydrated? What are you doing to it? What is the process Drying you're doing? Drying it, it out. You're removing the water. Drying it out. Exactly. You're removing the water because some of these microbes need that water in order to grow. So if they don't have that water, they can dry it out and that will eliminate their way to grow or survive. Another thing we could do is radiation. So this is done through ultraviolet light waves. The organism would absorb the light waves and that's going to cause a mutation or a change in the DNA and block the ability of the cell to reproduce because it's blocking the uh, metabolic process. And so that's going to cause death of the organism. Another thing we can use is sound waves called sonication. And these can cause the cells to lyse or break down. Strong vibra vibrations can interrupt the integrity of the cell wall or the membrane, and that can cause the microbe to disintegrate or die. And then filtration. Filtration um, uses materials with small pores to block the organism from being able to pass through the filtered liquids. This is a common method for removing microbes from things like vaccines or chemicals used in experimental testing. All right, next up we have um, disinfection. Before I go on to that, I wanna just talk about food for a second. So when it comes to food, sometimes we use heat to kill microbes in food. Sometimes the heat that we use actually destroys the quality of the food. And that can mess it up, especially if we're doing like the canning process. So we use commercial sterilization. And by using commercial sterilization, it allows just enough heat to be applied that it destroys the endospores of the botulinum, because that's the one that we're worried about is botulism, right? So it's able to destroy those endospores um, with commercial sterilization because it has just enough heat to destroy the spores, but not degrade the food. Now, botulism is deadly. That's why you can't give it honey to um, kids of a certain age, like small children. I think it's under five. And then it's also the reason why, uh, even when I was shopping for the food pantry, I never used to pay dented cans much attention. But now I pay them a lot more attention because those dented cans can also, um, there can be a small hole in that can and it can allow you know, to get in there. And once that starts to happen, it can infect the food that's in there and it makes somebody really sick to kill them. So somebody who's hungry might say, you know, to heck with it. This is what I got. I'm going to eat it. And they're going to open up that can. Here's the problem. If you know, they're struggling financially, they may not also have insurance or protection. If their body might be as great. So we may put them at a bigger risk just by giving them stuff that's in a can or um, that has potential for being contaminated. So you want to think about that whenever you're donating or you're using like canned products. Um, disinfection, this is a uh, destruction of vegetative organisms. We use either chemical or physical methods. 
It does not destroy the endospores. Okay, we can do disinfection through chemicals, ultraviolet light, boiling water, or steam. Um, it's usually um, used when the inert substance or surface is going to be treated chemically. And so we're disinfecting any living tissue called antisepsis. And the chemical that we use is going to be called an antiseptic. Then we have degermination, and this is the mechanical removing of the microbe. And this can be done in a limited spot. So like right before you inject something like your insulin or your Lovenox, you take an alcohol pen and you clean that area. That's degermination. Uh, medical instru instruments, these require sterilization. Uh, in other areas of life, we don't have to completely eliminate all the microbes. But when we're using medical instruments or we're doing surgical procedures, then we need to do that. We need to remove everything that we can. So um, in other areas of life, we're just going to reduce enough, reduce the microbes enough to prevent infection, disease, or the transmission of that disease. Sanitation will help lower the microbial counts to a safe public health level and minimize the chance of transmitting the disease. For example, if we sanitize the glassware and other table in restaurants, now, why does that matter that we sanitize the glass and spoons and things like that? Kill the germs. Okay, but I mean, what are we worried about? You can just wash it with soap and water, right? But you have viruses. Okay, and what else? They Cross-contamination. Cross-contamination. Well, I was thinking more along the lines of something like hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, you can get from what? Drinking off of somebody? Yep. Anything, work. Wet, anything wet except sweat. <laughs> so, yes, if you drink a straw behind somebody, you drink out of a glass, somebody that has an active hepatitis B, you can definitely get it. So, you know, people have things like that. We want to make sure that the restaurants are disinfecting and cleaning. Because how many of you have been into a restaurant and you got your dinner and you went to the saddle bar, which is a better example. Go to the saddle bar and you pick up a plate and plate on your fork and it's what? Dirty. Dirty. Right? Now, you don't even know if it's been washed. Did it get through the dishwasher? Did it just end up back in with the clean dishes? And it's probably contaminated other things that it's touching. So it's not even just your silverware that's affected. It's silverware and things. So you want to make sure, you know, I go to a restaurant and I see that, I usually leave. Um, but another thing that I'll look at in restaurants is the bathroom. Because to me, if they don't keep the bathroom clean, I'm not eating out of the kitchen. My son used to li deliver liquor to restaurants and he used to tell me the nightmares and I'm like, and he'd be like, Ma, don't go to this restaurant. Don't go to this one either. But sometimes you walk in and you don't wonder why people are getting sick. You wonder why they're not getting sick. So um, in the sanitization in um, restaurants for glassware, for table service, for institutions, for the home environment as well. Now, pasteurization, um, this was introduced by Louis Pasteur. This uses heat to kill vegetative bacteria. It helps reduce the number of organisms and it helps prevent spoiling food. So pasteurization is still currently used in the food industry. We use it for milk preparation, uh, preparing fruit juices, wine, and beer. It doesn't kill all of the organisms but it reduces or eliminates the most dangerous pathogens. And then uh, microbicidal. It helps destroy the microbes and it's broken down into uh, bac bactericidal agents that kill 
um, a bunch of these different agents. The bacteria, the fungus, I hope, um, these cause fungal death and viricides that inactivate the viruses. We also have uh, microbiostatic, and these inhibit microbial growth. So these agents will prefer, will prevent further bacterial growth and they'll inhibit any sort of fungal growth. Let's talk about asepsis and then I will go back over to um, microbial death. All right, asepsis is a series of actions that prevent the contamination and the spread of pathogens. Like good housekeeping, hand washing, bathing, um, handling food in a sanitary manner, uh, providing hygiene measures to, to prevent the spread of those pathogens between our clients. The technique, it, it's actually what we call a technique to prevent the entry of microorganisms into the sterile tissue. So what are we doing? We're hand washing, we're bathing, we're doing these sanitary techniques. Right, and hopefully we can minimize patients' interaction with any of the organisms that may be present that could cause an infection. And then we have antisepsis, which is any disinfection of living tissue. It's called antisepsis. And the chemical uses antiseptic. So antisepsis is defined as the practice of using antibacterial, antiviral, anti substances on the skin or tissue to prevent the spread of infections or things that would cause us to get sepsis because sepsis is really an infection in your bloodstream eventually. So that's what's going to speak to. The word sepsis comes from the Greek word sepian, which means to rot. So antisepsis means to keep it or make it clean. An example of how antisepsis is important today is if you take a look at the hygiene practices that occurred during COVID-19, the frequent hand washing, the use of antibacterial gel, um, both of these methods reduced the number of microorganisms so that infection of COVID-19 didn't spread as rapidly throughout the community. Hippocrates determined two common household substances could be used to clean wounds. So this isn't a new concept. Um, Hippocrates is old, right? So back in the day, he used um, and, um, wine to clean the wounds and to make sure that uh, the infectious agents were killed or at least reduced enough so that they didn't spread and cause damage. Now, if you notice, like in a lot of the old movies, a lot of them pour alcohol and stuff in the wounds. When someone was injured, and the concentration of the alcohol in there would kill some of those um, anti infectives. And then we talked about Pasteur a minute ago. He coined the term germ theory of disease, and he was important for treatment. So he also um, suggested treating open wounds with chemicals that would kill the microbes. microbes and then prevent or stop the spread of the infectious disease. Microbial death, this is the permanent loss of the reproductive ability of the microbe. We went through these slides, I'm just clicking through here. There's, this is around where we're at now. And now we're talking about the microbial death. All right, so this is where um, the uh, microbe loses the ability to reproduce. So there's permanent loss there. Uh, the death can only can be used only if reproduction cannot occur, even if the organism is given optimal growth conditions. So what we're saying here is we've tried to destroy the microbe. Now it's not considered permanent loss unless we can take that organism and put it in its um, optimal growth area and it still can't grow. Then we know we have true death there. When the microbe is killed by any method of control, they also have the, the uh, tendency to display exponential death. 
So in the death phase, also known as the decline phase, bacterial cell death starts to occur at greater numbers as the nutrients are depleted and toxic waste accumulate. So we call this an exponential decrease in cell numbers. In other words, they die at this fractional rate per unit. So it may be 50% of the organisms die every minute to start with. And then after a couple of minutes, 25% are still alive. After three minutes, 12.5% are still alive and so on. So they're depleting, but they're depleting at a fractional rate instead of all at once. The effectiveness of the agent that we use to kill these uh, microbes is influenced by other factors besides time. So it's influenced by the number of microbes present, and that is going to dictate how much time it's required to destroy all the contaminants. And that's because of the exponential death. Okay, so we have a lot of microbes present, then it'll break down to, to less microbes, less microbes, less microbes. And you can see like the more number of microbes you have and how effective that agent is, is going to affect how fast that exponential death rate happens. The nature of the organism to be destroyed. So we talked about those biofilms, right? Everything has these biofilms on it. So we have to break those biofilms or get through those biofilms as well. Other contaminants can include vegetative organisms and spores. Any target population that contains more than one organism can cause a broad spectrum of resistance. So when we're talking about broad spectrum, we're talking about like Vanco resistant um, here, VRE, okay? Because itself is a broad spectrum in its own. Normally, that's not our go-to drug. We go to other things first. When you're talking about things like seed and things that are really harmful and potentially um, strong microbe that can grow fast and do a lot of damage, we may have to use something um, a little stronger, something a little harder, something a little um, more um comprehensive that's going to cover the whole drug and really break it down because antimicrobes do affect like the cell wall in order to make the um, cell not um, able to uh, reproduce because if it's reproducing then it's making more cells microbes The pH of the environment also will have an influence on the effectiveness of the antimicrobial agent. The overall concentration of the microbial agent. So some are more active at higher concentrations. And so sometimes when you get the chemicals at the job, they don't always come mixed. Sometimes they'll come like a dry powder or liquid. So we're adding stuff to that agent to dilute it. You notice you look on the bottle, sometimes it'll say um, to dilute it with different levels of water, depending on what you're trying to destroy there. And so the concentration to destroy one thing may not necessarily be the same concentration to destroy something else. And also, it'll tell you things like times. Like, okay, in order to get rid of this, you have to leave it on for five minutes. If you're getting rid of this, you only need to leave it on for four minutes something that you may hear from like your infection control officer at the job like if they're coming around doing inspections they might tell you how to mix the chemicals especially if you're trying to get rid of covid or something like that how are you going to keep the nurse's station clean what can you use what's safe to use uh, when we're controlling these microbes we think about a lot of different things what is the most appropriate measure or method to get that control all right, so we may have to ask ourselves a few questions. Um, other things that we have to consider are the presence of other materials like organic matter, solvents, or things that might interfere with the microbial agent in itself. So you may not be able to use a certain chemical if you're spraying it on certain things, right? And why is this important? So um, I have an uncle, he actually died uh, from Drano. You guys know what that is, right? 
Yes. Everybody knows what Drano is. You put it in the yes. sink to unplug the sink, yes. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. what happened is the sink was leaking a little bit. A little hole in the uh, little pipe that goes to the uh, drain. So he put a bucket up under there. A little bucket he had in the garage. It was a dry bucket. He put it up under there to put a peak on the sides of it. Because he was using it for painting. And at some point, he may have even put some paint thinner in there. Okay? So the drain is clogged, and he goes in. And he's trying to fix the drain, and he pours Drano in there. Now, that Drano goes down the sink, but some of it leaks out of that hole, and it's that paint or that paint thinner that's in that bucket. And it gave us off this chemical reaction, and it killed him. Yeah. So you have to be super careful when you're doing, dealing with chemicals, where you spray them, what you put them on, to make sure that there's no interference there. Inhalation. I'm sorry, by inhalation. Yes. Oh wow. He inhaled the. You notice how on the bleach and the um, ammonia, or the bleach and the Mister Clean, which is all ammonia, by the way. I'm not supposed to mix those two products because they can give off a ghastly um, odor that is lethal. So really, when you're cleaning, if you're using pine salt, use pine salt. You can use bleach. You use bleach. You can use with the clean. Don't put it together. Because sometimes we do that trying to get rid of certain odors. You don't smell better. And I don't know if you've ever mixed Mr. Clean and bleach, but if you mix it right away, you can smell that toxicness coming off of it. So, um, some questions that we have to ask ourselves are when we're using the, um, that we're going to use to get rid of things or to decrease things. What is our goal here? We want to sterilize. Okay? Because if I'm spraying something on the counters, it's not likely going to sterilize. Take a scalpel out of the surgical procedure and just spray it down, keep it off with some of those wipes, right? We would have to send it to the outer flavor or to wherever we send those stuff and actually have it sterilized. We using the item for now. There was a big controversy about this, and it wasn't long ago. And it was about the probes that they use for things like colonoscopies and things like that. How are they cleaning these items? Because if you notice, a lot of these tools they have like small little pieces and stuff on them, right? Now, how many of you have ever taken something apart in your kitchen, like your blender or something like that, and you had washed it a couple of weeks ago? You washed it. You put it back together. Had it that much, you kind of rinsed it. You didn't even take it apart. Let's say it that way. Mm. And now you put something else in it, and you take it apart. And you know, there's like black mold on there because you didn't clean it right the first time. Now you're all grossed out. Y'all didn't clean that with it. Right? What happens? Baby bottles, uh, blenders, things with small parts. How do you effectively clean them? So your tools that you use in surgery, tools that we use for invasive procedures, it's the same thing. A lot of these have like small screws and small parts and things like that on there. Bacteria and germs can collect, especially if we're not using a productive device of anything on it. Because, I mean, I don't know. What, what do you call the the tubes and put the jam over it? And when it comes out, what do they do to sterilize it? What do they do to clean it? So it hasn't been that long since they investigated this. And to some of these um, hospitals in these surgical centers about how uh, they're cleaning these items and whether they're safe or not for the usual. So we're reusing an item, right? Then um, we have to think about would we be able to... Um, Use heat on that item. Use chemicals on that item. To use radiation on it. Sometimes, you know, you take your chemicals, your spray bottle, and you spray it on something to clean it, and you notice it gets kind of sticky, or it actually starts to destroy what you sprayed it on. Like it starts to melt it or break it down. So it's the same thing with these uh, medical items that you're using. 
can you use can you use that agent on it? Is it safe to use that agent on it? Will it damage that medical item in any way? Treatment going to leave some undesirable residue or chemically altered composition, and that's really what I'm talking about. So, um, even in your car, cleaning your car, now your car likes armor all wipes. But did you ever notice, or did you ever bleach on your car, like you know, the little bleach bottle, and just spray it? The little um, you know, that you clean the bathroom in the kitchen with. And you spray it on something in your car because you spray something and you want to get up with bleach. And you notice that afterwards when you touch that area, it's real sticky. And that stickiness never really goes away. So it now has this like uh, residue or this chemical on it. And it feels weird now from now on when you touch it. Is the engine able to penetrate the necessary but that is the removal of the biofilm. So can it penetrate all the way through? Because the biofilm is going to be resistant to whatever agent you're applying. So are you able to um, all the way through there? So now we're talking about um, physical methods. Okay, the most common is going to be um, heat. Okay, and that could be either dry heat or moist heat. All right, so more uh, dry heat is one of the simple methods where we um, expose the object to either direct flame or electrical heating. And if it's some sort of contaminated object like a wound dressing, then that's when we're going to use that incineration. So those would be bagged specifically in specific bags and boxes. Um, I used to do this all the time at my job where I would have boxes. And so when you have something on the unit, it either goes into a box at the unit or you bring it up and you put it in a main box. And then an outside company like Stericycle, some of them will come. And it's just certain things that you have to put in there. Certain um, wound dressings with certain body fluids on them. And they would go to some place where the heat is really high. It's a special area. And they're going to incinerate all those items. Uh, direct exposure to the intense heat can ignite some substances and cause them to reduce ashes. So we want to make sure that whatever we're using the incineration on, that it's suitable for that. Uh, particular process. So we would really eliminate most incineration, things like metals, resistant uh, glass, all right, where we're flaming it, we're putting um, direct heat on it. We also do this with certain needles. Um, again, if you're incinerating or using that incinerating process, now you're not necessarily going to reuse those needles. Sometimes we just break them down we incinerate them and we get rid of them. Not putting the heat on them to bring them back for use. Like scalpels and things like that, a lot of times they are reused once they're sterilized. Other than uh, incineration, dry heat is not as effective as moist heat or wet sterilization because it takes them a longer time and a higher temperature. And all objects that require sterilization won't be able to handle the high temperatures that we would put on it. So we use a temperature and a shorter time, we have a heat resistant material. Well, so we have something that is heat resistant that can go into like the dry heat oven. We might be able to put things like that in it. As long. And it's resistant to whatever you're applying that heat to, so it would be okay. The advantages of hot air sterilization is to be used on powders and other heat stable items that would uh, otherwise be adversely affected by things like steam. Or sometimes when we use uh, moist heat on metal objects, it causes it to develop rust. Using the dry heat, we can avoid that. 
Now for moist heat, you're gonna need specialized equipment, right? But it's much more effective in killing the microbes or controlling them. You can use it at a lower temperature for a shorter period of time than the dry heat. It's not, not with the same outcome. The moist heat is gonna control the growth and we can apply it um, steam, flowing heat, boiling water, pasteurization, and ultra um, high temperature sterilization. Both the pasteurization and the ultra high sterilization methods are for uh, control of microbes in the food industry. So they'll be also talked about when you get to food preservation if you go over that chapter. All right, so the mo moist heat sterilization, lower temperatures and shorter times. It does require special temp uh, movement. It's steam under heat, flowing heat, boiling water, pasteurization, and ultra high temperature sterilization. Steam under pressure is the most reliable to destroy all forms of probes. So we can use an autoclave for that. The autoclave is similar to a pressure cooker and it uses steam to 121 degrees Celsius or 250 degrees Fahrenheit. The average time is about 20 minutes to autoclave. The downside is we cannot use this to eliminate things like free wine. It also couldn't be used on things like powders, waxes, oils. Next one is flowing steam or boiling water. This was started by something called John Tyndall. It's called tindalization. Substances cannot be sterilized by the autoclave, but have to be subjected to intermittent sterilization. So tindalization helps reduce the flow, reduce the level of the spore forming bacteria. And these items are going to be placed in an area where they'll have free flowing steam for about 30 to 60 minutes. We do this for three days in a row. And we can use this to sterilize uh, material that contains sera, eggs, proteins, or carbs. If we boil items in water for 10 to 15 minutes, it's gonna kill most vegetative bacteria and virus. What have we been doing this with for years? Come on, what do we use? What do we boil in water to sterilize? What's the thing? Salt. Baby bottles. Baby bottles and um, pacifiers, right? And so we boil them into water. How many of you have boiled them and fell asleep and burnt all your nipples? <laughs> okay. You smell the plastic burning, you're like, oh! Many times. All right, so you're boiling that item in the water for 10, 15 minutes. That's going to kill most of the vegetative bacteria and the viruses, but it won't kill spores um, of the bacteria, the fungi, or the fragrance. It is used to disinfect and decontaminate items in the home and in the clinical environment. It is super effective against things like staphylococci, staphylococci, uh, and tuberculosis bacillus, right? But it has to be boiled for at least 30 minutes. Sorry, I'm just skipping ahead here. I've been talking and I'm not flipping the slides. So now I'm flipping them if anybody needs me to go back or stay on the slide for a minute. But you guys should have access to these. These are the ones that are in your um, canvas. 
Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, refrigeration or freezing. So this helps with uh, bacteria stasis. And stasis means what? If you have stasis in your legs, what's happening with that blood flow? It's not going to not moving. Yeah, it's not moving or it's going slowly back to the heart, right? So here, this stasis, this bacterial stasis, is going to help us control the growth, okay? It doesn't disinfect or sterilize, but it causes the cells to form these ice crystals uh, in the cell membrane. And it can puncture the cell membrane so it can inhibit the growth. Also, um, it inhibits the metabolism. All right, so a lot of bacterial cells, endospores, viruses, and tapeworms die from this. Why? Endospores, viruses, and tapeworms are cold hearted bees. Cold, so they can survive. We talked about all these. Now we're doing refrigeration. We just talked about that. All right, so here, um, look here on the slide. It also says uh, it grows uh, predominantly the mesophiles. Just talked about all this. Uh, desiccation and lyophilization. So we have um, metabolism with these microbes. That's how they're growing. They're metabolizing, they're growing. But in order to do that, they have them return the water. Okay? And so if we're able to dry it or remove the water, then we can slow or inhibit the growth altogether. The lyophilization is a technique that uses freezing and drying. And it can help preserve materials for years. It's used in the labs. And it uses liquid nitrogen. Now, how many of you are familiar with liquid nitrogen? So, I'm going to tell you a little story. I used to be a mechanic on RF 4 fighter jets in the military. And I handled liquid nitrogen every day. And the liquid nitrogen is what we use when we're flying at high altitudes in the jets to breathe. That liquid nitrogen is super cold, like you can't put on your skin. Cold. It shows how cold it was. They would take a frog, dip it in the liquid nitrogen, and then toss the frog immediately on the ground. And that frog would just shatter. That's how cold it is. Poor frog. I know. That's what they do. Military don't care. You know, they're crazy. Um. We can use the liquid nitrogen or the dry ice, and we can freeze these cultures, okay? And then later, turn it into gas through vacuum treatment, and some cells can actually come back to life. So this can help with some cells when we want to freeze them or use them later. You just have to be careful with the ones that would come back to haunt you later. All right, osmotic pressure. This is about, you know, you talk about osmosis all the time. You probably learned a lot about this in PN school. You'll learn even more about it now in physics, in your micro class and your patho class. You should be learning about it. You also learn about it in your med surge classes. So osmotic pressure is um, using either a high salt or sugar concentration in uh, food preservation. So molds are resistant to the osmotic pressure because they will thrive in either a high salt or a high sugar environment. These are considered hypertonic environments.
the um, hyperatonic environment will cause the loss of water from the cell. Again, some of these can't survive without those without that water. So it's not always effective against some molds, and some molds have a greater ability to grow in these hypertonic environments. So you also have to consider that. Now, radiation is a type of energy that comes from electromagnetic waves. It travels through the space. There's two types, ionizing and non-ionizing. So radiation is affected by two things. Actually, three things. These are the three things that we tell the nurse when you're going into the room. Okay, if someone is getting radiation, these are the three things that you have to worry about. Four things, I'm sorry. We used the top three, but they added this other one I see on this slide. Okay, so how much time are you going to be in the room? So whenever someone is getting radiation treatment and radiation has the ability to affect you, typically we're going to limit your time in that room to about 30 minutes per eight-hour shift. Distance from the source. So what does that exactly mean? So if you're taking care of somebody that's receiving radiation and they have some sort of an implant radiation at the bedside, yourself far away from that with your feet. Like if they have the radiation in the groin, you may want to stand towards the head of the bed and talk to them. And then shielding. So shielding is the apron that they put on you. Okay. They also have a um like a little badge that you can put on. And that badge actually measures the amount of radiation that you're exposed to when you go into that room. And then here we're talking about the effects of radiation. So how is it going to um, help you? The radiation has the ability to penetrate. So we can go through the body, maybe hit areas that we couldn't get to unless we opened up the body and went that way. Might not be the best way to treat somebody. All right, so ionizing radiation is going to be things like the electron beams, X-rays. Their wavelength is about one nanometer, and the radiation can cause denaturation of the DNA, so it's going to break it down. All right, there's other molecules that will interfere with the hydrogen bonding, so that's going to cause a mutation or death of the cell. The electron beams, these are effective at killing the microbes in just a few seconds. They can even be used for st surface sterilization. Gloves, syringes, suture material are all typically sterilized, sterilized using the electron beam. I learned something new there. See, did you how many of you guys knew that? All right. Well, I'm willing to admit I just learned that. Gamma rays. Gamma rays penetrate deep into the material, but may require more time. Used for sterilization of disposable medical equipment like needles, and they're used in the U.S. Postal Service. How do you think that? Mm -hmm. Why? Right. Why do we need to sterilize the mail? Anthrax. Anthrax. Okay, chemical warfare, micro warfare. A lot of people can send viruses and things like that through the mail. Wow. The United States and Russia has enough polio, enough of some of these other um, diseases that are supposed to be eradicated stored for biochemical warfare. The United States too, yes. So all of them have some of these diseases that are supposed to have been eradicated stored um, in a place where you could bring that um, infection if they wanted to. And you could take uh, multiple people for chemical warfare if they wanted to, using these diseases that they have either buried or you know, um, uh, sitting in something that's conducive to it being able to grow. They may even have some of them frozen, right? Because some of these we see that can be frozen uh, x-rays that that is going to penetrate the deepest 
but they require a lot of time to control microbial growth. And again, you know, sometimes with um, radiation, it's not always the best for us. It might kill the microbes and then create our issues. Ionizing radiations have wavelengths greater than one nanometer. So this would be things like UV light, visible light, infrared radiation, microwaves, radio waves. <laughs> has a wavelength of about two nanometers, and it can cause damage to the DI DNA by forming bonds between peribines, thymine, and cytosine. So that's one of your building um, amino, um, amino acids, thymine, and part of your building blocks in your body. Let me say it that way. It's probably a better description of it. All right, we need these in order for the body to do certain things. This is part time. Your body is building, growing, right, um, through the DNA. So if we can um, break the bonds between the thymine and the cytosine, then we can inhibit the production or the reproduction of that DNA. The UV light is also used to disinfect air. Uh, it can disinfect certain transparent fluids and surfaces of objects. The UV lamps are also found in places like nurseries, hospital rooms, operating rooms, and cafeterias. It can also sterilize vaccine, and it can be used as an alternative to chlorine in sewer treatment plants. So we also know, like, they sell a lot of stuff, like, on the internet that has these UV rays in it. Like that, you can put your keys, your cell phone, things like that in it to try to sterilize it. And then microwaves kill vegetative pathogens in the presence of moisture. All right, filtration. This is a mechanical separation of solids from flu fluids or gases. And we use filters that have various sizes. Filters are produced with pores that are small enough to filter out both the bacteria and the viruses. This is used for heat sensitive material, so select ophthalmic solutions, antibiotics, vaccines, liquid vitamins, enzymes, and syrup. Filters are used currently in membrane filters manufactured from a nitrocellulose or plastic. And the pore sizes can range from uh, 23 micrometers to less than 0 0.01 micrometer. The smallest viruses are able to be filtered with the filter um, using a very small pore size of 0 0.01 micrometer. Chemical control. In addition to the uh, physical factors, we have chemical factors that can also help kill the microbes. There are different chemical agents that are used to control growth on the non-living agents and on the living tissue. Surgical instruments, countertops, toilets, all use chemical agents. So we have disinfectant and anti- Septics. These are antimicrobial chemicals that come in the form of a liquid, a solid, or a gas. Most of these chemicals are able to at least disinfect, provide some sort of antisepsis. Chemicals used on non living surfaces are referred to as disinfectants. Chemicals that are used on living tissue are known as antiseptics. So you can spray the Clorox on your wound, right? You spray it on the kitchen counter. But on your wound, you might put like Neosporin, right? Uh, disinfectants and antiseptics can be classified as bactericides, fungicides, algicides, and virucides. Some spores or resistant microbes can survive the chemical disinfection. Agents don't get rid of all the microbes, 
okay, for some in the presence of some of those. So, like, you need the normal flora that you have in your belly. So, you don't want to. So, what factors influence the antimicrobial effects? Uh, chemical disinfectants, more in the healthcare industry or the cleaning industry, that we can decontaminate the fences, the equipment, the floor, the bathroom. Uh, the nature of the agent we have to consider. But what is the population size? So here we're talking about how many microbes are we dealing with? Right? It's going to take us longer to kill a large population of microbes than a small one. It may not be effective if we have mixed microbes here. So we may have more than one microbe, and if we do, and all of them. How long are we going to expose the microbe to the agent? So again, a lot of times when you're looking on the side of the bottle, it'll tell you stuff like if you're trying to kill H1N1 flu, it's on for five minutes. So if you try to kill um Something simpler, it might say leave it on for 30 seconds or leave it on for a minute. Uh, local environment. This can reduce the effectiveness of the chemical agent. And that may require more exposure time or a higher concentration in order to get through, penetrate through that bio that biofilm. And then uh, the concentration of the agent. So in concentrations, chemical may kill certain microbes. It may need a different concentration to kill others. So for example, 20% ethyl alcohol um, to kill microbes is actually considered more effective than 95% because at 95%, the alcohol denatures the proteins rapidly and causes coagulation. Alcohol cannot then penetrate deeper into the cell. It stops it from being able to do that. So on the other hand, 70% alcohol on the hands slowly coagulates the proteins and the alcohol can then penetrate deeper into the cell. So sometimes, you know, stronger is not always better. And it goes back to what are we dealing with? Uh, we talked about the uh, numbers, the temperature. An increase in temperature increases the effectiveness of the chemical agent if the stability is not exceeded. Lower concentrations of the chemical temperature sometimes. And then organic matter. Organic matter, blood, all decrease the effectiveness of the chemical agent. So even if you tap first, you have to go back and clean it again once you remove that soil of items. Evaluating the disinfectant. So EPA usually has a lot to do with this. Decide what can be used on what and how we can use it on what. Down to the point where if you're using a certain chemical, she can go to their website and it will tell you if that chemical is effective and that's what you're using it for. It'll also tell you the parameters to the time in which you have to use that chemical. Um, the EPA is concerned with testing and regulating disinfectants. Why? Because it can become hazardous. They can be hazardous. So if I'm cleaning like um, breathing equipment and things like that, it's chemicals I'm not going to be able to use because it could do more harm than. So FDA oversees the use of chemical agents on humans and animals. You guys see the commercial for the poop spray? Uh, sprays it on his tongue, sprays it on the dog, sprays it everywhere. And what he's trying to say is a totally Hey, 
efficiency of a disinfectant or antiseptic can be accomplished by two methods. The use dilution test and also the dis diffusion method. The use dilution test is a method for testing the effectiveness of the disinfectant and the antiseptic. In test disinfectants and antiseptics were tested using another procedure that would compare the activity of the disinfectant with that of the actual tool. And so now we use the use dilution test instead. And the test organisms for this testing procedure are Salmonella, Enterica, Lys aureus, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So the test uses a set concentration of the organisms on a stainless steel cylinder, and then they allow it to dry. And then they put the cylinders in the tubes of the um, test disinfectant for a certain period of time that is pre-set, pre-established by the person that makes the agent. So that's going to be the manufacturer, All right? And then the cylinders are placed in the growth tubes, and the organisms um, are allowed to grow if they're dead. So we look at whether or not the agent was able to kill those organisms in the expected time. The phenol coefficient test, that was the old test. Okay, so that was where they were comparing the activity of the disinfectant with that of the phenol. And then the diffusion test, the dis, I'm sorry, dis diffusion method uses a filter paper disc with the chemical disinfectant and it's placed on an agar plate, all right, along with the uh, bacterial culture. And the chemical will diffuse from the disc into the agar around the disc. The size of the area of the chemical infiltration around the disc is function of the solubility of the chemical and its molecular size. So microbes on the agar will not grow in the area around the disc. The chemical is working against that organism. So if it's susceptible, if there's no growth, I'm sorry, the area of growth around the disc is called the zone of inhibition. All right, so no growth would mean that it's not effective on this particular microbe. The zone of inhibition is the um, is variable and dependent. That's that area of growth around the agar. Okay, and it's dependent upon whether the agar is used, the amount of organism used, concentration of the chemicals, the uh, incubation period, and the atmospheric period or um, condition. All right, uh, phenols, these are um, known as carbolic acid. And this was in, by Joe Lister in 1867. Just going to stop my share there for a minute. I got Lister up here somewhere. I'm just trying to find them.
All right, so uh, phenol, co commonly known as carbolic acid, was used by Joe Lister as an antiseptic for surgery as long ago as 1865. And so it's the principle used today in making these phenolic resins and plastics. And uh, phenol contains carbon dioxide, carbon hydrogen, and oxygen. So it's a combination of those three things. Now, um, what these phenols or these phenolics do is they work on the whole membrane. It's effective even in the presence of organic material. It's going to kill most vegetative forms, but it's not that effective against spores. Can you guys see the screen show again? Or no? no not yet. No, I don't see no. nothing. All right, let me get it back up. So um, they're not very effective for spores. They remain active on surfaces for long periods of time. About 1% to 3% emulsions of Lysol and Krillin are used as household disinfectants. Uh, several phenolics are used as sprays in the hospital setting. There is a disadvantage. Sometimes they have an intense odor. Sometimes they can irritate the skin or the mucous membranes. So you have to kind of be careful where you use them at. Right, but they'll denature the protein, they'll disrupt the cell membrane. They're even uh, effective in the presence of certain organic contaminants like vomit. <laughs> Again, they have that intense odor, so that's part of the issue. And they're not really used as a germicide. Halogens, um, iodine, chlorine, and fluoride. And bromine is a big one that they use now in the hospitals. And the reason why they use it is because they have some of the same effects of uh, chlorine. But the difference with the bromine is it doesn't have that strong chlorine smell. So it's supposed to be around people that have like asthma, uh, respiratory issues, and things like that. So that's one of the main reasons why they flipped over to that. You can mix to the manufacturer's instructions on certain things based on um, how you mix it and how long you leave it on. So it uses oxidation of the enzymes and it stops the enzymes from being able to metabolize and, and that's going to stop the cell from growth. Chlorine and iodine are the halogens of choice for germicides. Chlorine is used as a disinfectant for more than 200 years. Again, um, chlorine comes in a gas, and it's used to disinfect drinking water, pools, uh, large bodies of waste. And then we have something called hypochlorite, and that's used to disinfect like food equipment in the um, dairy. Also, common household bleach is a deodorizer, stain remover, and a disinfectant. Surprise, they don't really talk about the bromine here, but in the um, industry, that's what we use, is the bromine. And it's been one of our choice of chemicals because and of the breathing issues with the chlorine. Chlorine is dangerous. And if you have a truck that's moving chlorine, um, from one place to another, and that truck has a spill or something happens, you notice, you hear about these from time to time on TV, okay? And we have to evacuate the whole area because chlorine is dangerous. It can cause a lot of damage to the body if it's not used appropriately. 
but people say it's sold over the counter, so they think it's safe. Um, iodine, when mixed with water, rapidly can penetrate microbes, and it also will interfere with the metabolism. Now, iodine is something when I was a kid that our parents used to use a lot. They would spray it on stuff, and they would use a lot to kill things with. Again, if it's not used right, it can be dangerous. A uh, one to five percent iodine solution is used as a topical antiseptic before surgery. So this is one of the things they might give you in a bottle to wash yourself with. They might say scrub your whole body with this soap because um, you're going in for surgery. So we want all the skin to be clean when you come in tomorrow morning. So when you come in before you come in in the morning, take a shower with the soap the night before. Um. It's also useful in the treatment of burned or infected skin. 10% iodine is used to disinfect non-living objects. And then we also have alcohol surfactants and quaternary compounds. So alcohol or in itself is effective against vegetative forms of bacteria, fungi, and viruses. But ineffective against fungal and bacterial spores. Commonly use alcohols or isopropyl. Uh, that's going to be your rubbing alcohol, ethyl alcohol, which is drinking alcohol. Now, alcohols will denature the proteins and dissolve the lipid membranes. Isopropanolol is more effective than the ethanol, and it's used as an antiseptic. About 70% alcohol is what we consider effective, and most of your hand sanitizers be right around there. Surfactants are surface active chemicals. They can reduce the surface tension of a solvent, a microbe, but it reduces the attachment to the surfaces. Surgical soaps that are antiseptic contain antimicrobial agents. So it stops the microbe from being able to attach. And then the quaternary compounds or clots. Now, these are kind of like the uh, bromide. We use a lot of these during COVID. This is what we were ordering to clean things with. Okay, so we're ordering it, we're mixing it, and these are what we're um, cleaning with. Again, these have to be left on the surface for a certain amount of time. Uh, you can clean like, you know, um, surface tops where germs might lay and become reactivated. So like in the doctor's offices where people commonly sneeze and cough and those germs come out, those are the areas where you can use these and they can prevent, you know, additional people from becoming contaminated. Some pathogens like Pseudomonas, aragonosa can thrive in the presence of these quaternary compounds. And so sometimes they're classified as a lower level disinfectant. These are safe things that you can use like in a hospital area or somewhere where people are living in the area and you need to decontaminate. Hydrogen peroxide, by the way, is one of these. And these will destroy the cell wall and the membrane. We don't know why, but they can. Again, you can see they're colorless, tasteless, harmless to humans unless in a high concentration. So you can see why these would be more conducive to use in an environment where people are actually living. A lot of people don't like the smell of bleach and they don't want to smell other chemicals either. metals, these have a high atomic weight. So mercury, silver, gold, arsenic, copper, and zinc. And they alter the shape of the protein. So back in the day, newborns were treated with a cream that had the 1% silver nitrate caused by the materia and gonorrhea. The newborn developed that just by going through mom's birth canal with mom and gonorrhea. So actually the newborns are still treated, but they use a different drug to treat them with. But whenever the newborn is born, by law, this has to go in their eyes because we don't know who has the gonorrhea and who doesn't. Someone doesn't tell you and they haven't been tested. Just put it to everybody. 
um, every infant that's born so that they don't go blind. Now, silver nitrate is one of those chemicals that's very dangerous. We still use it there. We also use this for what? Anybody know? I can't hear you on mute. Push your space bar. Wounds. Say it again. Wounds. For wounds. Okay. We use a lot for, you know, the little gross wounds around the tube, around the G-tube, from it rubbing and irritating. We also use it a lot for that. Um, but it can't be mixed with other drugs. So when you're handling this or handles all your discarded items at the facility is going to tell you this has to be put in a separate container because if it gets in with other things, it can cause right. Right. Silver is still used in some dressings. We also use this for burn creams and uh, sometimes for catheters. The silver nitrate um, is also used a lot for burns. Uh, copper used in fish tanks, swimming pools, and reservoirs, and it helps prevent algae or algicide by interfering with the chlorophyll. And then also thimerosal, this is a mercury compound. In uh, for years, it was in therm thermometers, right? But we took it out of there. But they also use this in vaccines. So in certain vaccines, this thermosol is. So we're kind of place where they give vaccines, especially to people that um, are developmentally disconnected. Because the family members are going to call and they're going to say, I don't want you giving my son that flu shot, that vaccine that has the thermosol in it. Because you know, it's a preserver. It's going to preserve the vaccine. But some people believe that this thermosol causes autism. So they don't want their kids to get it. All right, mercury is a metabolic poison. There have been concerns raised with the public about it. So they no longer use it as a preservative in the U.S. for protection of preschoolers against 12 infectious diseases. It is still used in some of the influenza vaccines. And I know that for a fact because, you know, I used to get letters every year from family members. Don't give my um, uh, member this flu vaccine. So I would have to order a certain number of flu vaccines every year when I ordered my vaccines that were thermosol free so that we could give it to these clients. Alkylating agents. Now, to tell you how just destructive these are, that we use for chemo. We use alkylating agents all the time for chemo. Alkylating agents help a group of chemicals that are toxic because they can inactivate the nucleic acids and proteins. And the agents include all hides and ethylene oxide. All hides are the most common, and they're used. Um, in the form of a liquid or a gas. So, aldehyde. You guys are familiar with that one, right? The glutamide is a yellow liquid and it's used as a high level disinfectant and it'll kill most bacteria, viruses, and fungi in just a 2% solution in a 10 minute span. Exposing items for 10 hours will achieve sterilization. Now, formaldehyde, you guys are more familiar with this, right? This is a strong smelling gas that readily dissolves in water form formalin. Formalin is carcinogenic and has limits to clinical use. And then we have ethylene oxide, and this is a colorless ad. It exists as a gas at room temperature, used as a sterilizing agent in the hospital and some dentist's office. It also helps us disinfect plastics and sensitive instruments in the hospital. It is highly toxic and explosive, so you have to be specially trained to use it. You can only use it on certain equipment. They're called special ETO sterilizers. And then we have hydrogen peroxide, 
eight years and an antiseptic and it will oxidize the cell wall or the cell membrane. For food preservation, uh, safe food preservation involves effective killing of the microbes, preventing fat oxid oxidization, process known as RAND acidity. We use other methods to preserve food, and these would be things like canning, pickling, freeze drying, pasteurization, smoking, or radiation. So pasteurization is going to reduce the microbial load. So we use time, temperature, and effectiveness. Pasteurization uses temperatures below the boiling point so that it doesn't damage the food. There are two types of pasteurization. High temperature, short time, which uses a temperature such as 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, and then rapidly cools it to four degrees Celsius. For the ultra high temperature, which is done by holding the liquid at a temperature of 138 degrees Celsius for about a fraction of a second, and then stored at room temperature. The USDA is responsible for pasteurization standards in the U.S. Right, so other methods that we use, pressure canning. So we boil out of the jar, and when the jar cools, it forms this vacuum. All right, so uh, foods that have microbes can spoil, but if we use this heat canning, it can preserve those foods. Acids and sugars are also used. Low acid, acid foods contain clostridium botulinum. And this is an ob obligate anaerobe. What's that mean? Who knows? Isn't it without oxygen? Do you need oxygen? So it doesn't need oxygen to grow, right? Yeah. Is that what it means? I, th I think, doesn't it use, wait, hold on. I thought they need oxygen. Well, maybe hey, it look doesn't... it up. Tell me, what does it mean? If you don't know, look it up. That's the best way to tell me. Somebody read it for me. It says, is microorganisms that are killed by normal atmospheric um, concentrations of oxygen? Okay, so that means... Too much oxygen is going to kill it. Is that what it means? Yes. Okay. So actually live in the then, right? Is there going to be oxygen in that jar? What do say you think? One, say that one more time. You, you, it, you well, went in, it went out. When we're canning, is there going to be oxygen in that jar? No. I don't think so. I don't know. Would it be in there since they're killed by oxygen? No, it's not going to be in there. And that's why they can survive in this canning process. Okay, because they don't need oxygen. If they're in an aerobic condition where there's oxygen, then they're going to likely die. Okay, but they live, they thrive in the area of oxygen. The obligate anaerobe thrives in an area that lacks oxygen. All right, and these can be responsible for food poisoning. Seals that are broken or cans with bulging ends indicate contamination are, and are deemed high risk foods. So this is why whenever a can a seal the, the seal on a can is broken or the can is penetrated with some kind of hole, you don't want to eat that food. All right. Well, I talked about this earlier. So, like, you know, the grocery store is smart because really it should be illegal for them to sell dented cans knowing this, right? But what do they do with those dented cans? Discount. Discount them. Right, they discount them. We don't care if you get sick. We'll sell it to you cheaper. So when you get sick, it didn't cost you as much. That's what they're really saying. 
All right, eradication. This is a new technique, and so this, this the food is sterilized through radiation or eradication. All right, and it changes the DNA of the microbe. Sterilization is achieved depending on the size of the DNA. So the faster, the lar the larger the DNA, the faster the organism is killed. If it's a smaller DNA, it requires longer doses. Prions don't have DNA, so we can destroy them through irradiation. Some other things that we'll do is drying the food. So back in the day, they would hang the meat in like a salt locker and they would dry it. Freezing. That would inactivate the microbe. Um, but certain microbes, what can happen when we kill it? Can it come back? We couldn't really hear you because your headset went out. Freezing will inactivate the microbe. What happens when we thaw it? Can the microbe return? Yes. Yes. Curing is the addition of salt and sugar or nitrates to preserve flavor and color. And then salt also inhibits microbial growth by plasmolysis. So it's going to break it down. Fermentation is a process that's used to preserve products like wine, beer, cider, and vinegar. And marmalades are usually prefer, preserved by sugar. And it has an osmotic gradient that inhibits the microbial All right, number nine, let's get through that quickly. We got a little bit of time left. Any questions on that? Well, I thought I had chapter nine up here. I guess I don't. Let's close all these out. Not week nine, chapter nine, Suey. Well, you guys might have me tomorrow too because Miss Smith has the flu. I don't think she's going to be coming here tomorrow. Are we going to have the quiz tomorrow? Yes, you will still have the quiz. Oh, okay. This says chapter nine, safety issues, but this is bringing up micro lab techniques. Is that the same thing? It says microbiological laboratory safety issues. I wonder why it's coming up chapter eight, though. Yes, it comes up chapter eight, but it's chapter nine or, or vice versa. I was looking at it. All right. Well, I'm just going to go through the book and the notes that I'm not going to pull the PowerPoint up because I don't know if that PowerPoint matches. And so we'll just go through the chapter. It says micro. Okay. I have chapter nine micro lab. I think they might have just put the wrong PowerPoint up there. Let's see. Um, I probably don't. Let me see if I can pull that one up through Evolve.
You don't want that. I will find out what she covered for you up to what part on chapter six so that we can finish that tomorrow so you guys won't be behind next week. And then let's see how much we get through this one here. And then whatever we don't get through this today, we'll get through tomorrow, I guess. It looks like you only have these two chapters for this week. Why does that keep going to there? That's not where I wanted to go. All right, that PowerPoint should be here. All right, let's see if we can share that. Right, so we have three agencies that look at acceptable guidelines for the labs as far as safety, and that is going to be OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the CDC, and the WHO. All right, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is the lead agency uh, charged with protecting the health and safety of all Americans. So most labs are going to follow the OSHA guidelines. Labs will have departments like microbiology, hematology, serology, biochemistry. And so all these different departments do different things. Now for biosafety, the most commonly acquired lab infections caused by bacteria. The easiest way to stop the spread of the disease is through hand washing. There are different safety levels for microbiological and medical labs are four levels of containment. And the National Institute of Health determines this. We introduced the concept of risk groups. And they were classified into four risk groups based on the degree of pathogenicity. So we already talked about this bio safety here. All right. We have guidelines and standards that are available. Um, to the different uh, labs, OSHA who is responsible for the majority of it. And then in addition to them, you have the CDC, the WHO, and the health, Department of Health and Human Services. Biosafety level one, uh, in this level, microbes don't usually cause an infection in people to pose minimal hazards. Biosafety level one units are found in high school labs, uh, in water testing labs. People working in the labs have to wear protective coats and gloves. And then there's hazard warning signs on the doors. There's also a hand washing sink. So examples of these organisms would be E. coli, Actobacillus SPP, and Micrococcus luteus, Pseudomonas SPP. Then we have bio level safety two. The patients in this category are considered moderate risk. So immunization to HD is recommended by OSHA, which 
you see that's at high risk for exposure. Of course, we're talking about blood or blood products. In addition to the procedures that we use in BSL-1, lab personnel would also receive additional training in how to handle these pathogens. Samples of level two are salmonella, Aspergillus, Chuck B, hepatitis A, B, and C, Streptococcus pyrogenes, Albacea, uh, measles, and mumps. Then we have bio level safety three. This applies to clinical diagnosis, teaching, research, or production labs uh, that are using some sort of either original or exotic agent. All the windows in the lab would be closed or sealed. The lab would be separate from any area of traffic. Change of clothes room included at the entrance to the lab, and there would be containers in there for you to include your clothing. Examples of microbes in this category would be Yersinia pestis, Rutella SPP, Pars, Bacillus anthracis. And then we have bio-level safety four. The level is required for working with dangerous or exotic microbes. It's completely isolated from all other buildings. Personnel leaving the building or entering the building has to go through the clothing change and personal shower room. All supplies needed for the BSL-4 enter a double fire platform. Daily inspection of all containment parameters is completed and recorded before any lab work starts. Examples of this type of uh, exposure would be Ebola, Antivirus, Marburg, Smallpox, Laza virus, All right, so um, standards for such chemicals in the lab are developed by NEOSH. This is National Institute for Oc Occupational Safety and Health. So any chemical, um, first of all, you're gonna have to have a safety sheet. So like I used to have a cabinet and all my safety sheets are in there. And on the um, safety sheet, typically there's a lot of things that you have to have. One is the chemical name and structure. The chemical abstract service. This is a number assigned, so you can easily go in and look up stuff in a database. Our text number. And this is the registry of toxic effects of chemical substances. It has a DOT number. Now, that DOT number is very important because you have to transport this chemical or to leave the facility or if there's a spill or anything like that, you're going to want that number. And by the way, if you're packaging it and you're putting it on the DOT truck, you are responsible. Uh, a synonym, so a close name to it, a trade name, conversion factors, exposure limits. How would we treat someone exposed to it? All right, what would we expect to see? What symptoms, if, if someone were exposed, what symptoms would we expect it to, expect to see? And then... Um, what was their exposure route? What symptoms do they have? What organs might come up? You have to have the chemicals stored properly in the lab, right? So generally chemicals will be stored and labeled as either a solvent, an inorganic material, a base, an oxidizer, a poison, or an explosive. So like if you walked into my room at the job, I have all these bins stacked up there because I have a poster. And on the poster, it says, well, I can go in that bin so that you know because if it's stored with something else, it has the potential to cause some sort of chemical reaction. Some things are explosive. So we talk about how they break down in the environment when we get rid of them. So when you put it out into the environment, it can leach into the ground and into the water. So it can affect you through the water in the rivers because that's where your drinking water and, and things like that come from. Each lab should have an MSDS, um, which is manufacturer's material safety data sheet. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm keeping the fire on these MSDS sheets. 
That's on every chemical that you have on the premises. You have to have one of these sheets on. Radiation, uh, noise, you use ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Again, we talked about shielding, talked about time, talked about exposure. You have to limit yourself. Okay? Exposure can lead to radiation sickness, and that can affect your bone marrow, your GI tract, and your central nervous system. Non-ionizing radiation like UV light and visible light can damage your skin and your eyes. And UV light damages DNA and causes dimerization, which eventually leads to skin cancer. Eyes exposed to UV light can also um, develop macular degeneration, which is where your centralized vision goes out. And now um, you can't see like periphery out to the sides and everything. It's also going to affect your focus, your ability to do uh, fine motor skills because of not being able to see. Uh, labs use equipment that produce a lot of sound energy. This can cause hearing loss over a amount of time, a period of time. And remember, they can sometimes use sound waves to break things down. Some labs use flames for sterilization or other equipment to generate high amounts of heat. You have to be careful, make sure you're wearing the proper protective gear, preventing, preventing yourself not only from chemical, but also thermal burns. And then low temperatures are dangerous, especially if you're working around uh, super low temperatures, anything below 80 degrees Celsius. And this includes dry ice and liquid nit nitrogen. So I know with the liquid nitrogen, when we worked around it, you got to have special gloves. You also can't have anything on you like sunglasses, um, screw, fall and create a spark. Because the smallest spark with that is going to blow you and everybody else to eternity. Um, so safety equipment is an integral part of all that. So the most safety equipment you're going to see are going to be things like fire extinguishers, eye washing, hand washing stations, um, fire alarms. So as far as the extinguishers, every extinguisher is different, okay? And the extinguishers put out different types of fires. So like type A is going to put out combustibles or rubber. B would put out like flammable liquids and gases. is for live electrical equipment. Type D is for combustible metals like magnesium, lithium, and titanium. Meaning they can explode when they're exposed or activated by certain chemicals. Uh, type K, cooking media, cooking oils, and fats. And lots of purpose work against A, B, and C fires. So any type of multi-purpose fire extinguisher would work if you have a type A, a type B, or a type C fire. So common combustible, flammable liquids, or live uh, electrical equipment. These requirements, okay, these are going to help control exposure to any sort of vapor in the lab. So that hood has a fan or something on it, and usually it's a fan that pulls the air, that draws the air out of the room. Okay, so usually it's going to draw um, poisonous or noxious fumes from out of the lab. General radioisotopic hood that is um, safe for any sort of radiation exposure. And then um, biosafety cabinet to prevent exposure to biohazardous agents and percoloic acid hoods to use if you're using percoloic acid. So those would be used just in those conditions. Other safety equipment is the autoclave. And usually this is to sterilize equipment by using this room steam, eye wash, and safety showers in case you're exposed. Uh, you want to get rid of the clothes. You're probably going to have to have a change of clothes, so you probably would have a change of clothes wherever you're working at if you're working in this environment. And then also uh, personal eye wash, uh, hand showers, refrigerator, and freezer units um, for specific chemical or biological needs. 
and then a special hazardous waste program, uh, which is one of the things that I ran. So you have this hazardous waste program and all your waste has to be divided by how it leaches into the ground, by how it interacts. So everything is separate. A concept we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago. Did all this. Uh, protective gear would include gloves, respiratory protection, eye protection. So gloves are made of latex and they have foam starch on the inside, right? So it makes them easy to go off and on. Some gloves now are made with vinyl or nitrile because of the latex allergies. Also, um, respiratory protection. So well before COVID, um, any place that you work that exposes you to specific fumes and stuff, it's hard to have you fit with a um, specific mask. It's fitted for that mask to make sure it has to be proper mask for those chemicals to make sure that you're not breathing them in and that you're not getting sick. Um, also, um, they might have certain breathing equipment attached to the mask. So like with firefighters, you'll see that they have like an oxygen tape attached to their mask so that they can get additional oxygen. Clothing, lab coats, uh, shoes that are closed, you don't want open toe shoes because of spills, right? And sometimes they'll make you wear still toe shoes depending on where you work. And then safety glasses, side shields, prevent things from splashing in the eyes. Sometimes, you know, they just have a mask that you pull over. Those aren't always as safe. And then um, safety and healthcare facilities. So, I'm sorry, you're looking at going to have some kind of plan in place for hazardous waste, for chemical spills, for emergencies. And the majority of them are going to have those MSDS uh, sheets on file. If people aren't following those kind of rules, you probably don't want to be working there anyway. All right? Because they're not looking out for your safety. Other uh, safety issues are bloodborne pathogens, biological hazards, and drug exposure. So nursing homes have the highest rates of injury and illness with healthcare workers. OSHA has issued ego ergonomic guidelines to prevent musculoskeletal disorders of nursing home personnel. So common bloodborne pathogens in the healthcare settings are C, uh, viral hemorrhagic fever, Ebola and Marburg, and MRSA is big because a lot of people don't handle um, the MRSA stuff the way that they should. Okay, another thing, um, hepatitis A, so I call it hepatitis ass, and that's because it's fecal oral, okay? So if you have either dirty food or you're cleaning diapers, you're doing a formant, you do anything that's going to expose you to that fecal matter, okay? And then you put your hands in your mouth, that's your hepatitis A, okay? Hepatitis B, I call hepatitis B, B except sweat. Hepatitis B, you can get from drinking after someone. It's in the saliva. It's in all those body fluids except sweat. And then hepatitis C, I will see you later because you are probably engaging in risky sex and IV drunks. So those are the main ways that these are spread and um, go across to people. Hepatitis A, you notice wasn't on here or common in the healthcare setting because usually people get that from restaurants, from daycare centers. And then broken glass, biohazard waste, sharps containers. Containers and broken glass with your needles. Everything else, drugs don't go in there, okay? They go in with your hazardous, other hazardous waste disposal. We talked about this already. We talked about this already. Make sure that if you do get stuff, that you document it. You notify your um, supervisor right away. You can come for treatment for. Most of the stuff we just talked about. This is just about proper disposal of your hazardous waste. What are your risk management procedures? So usually if something happens, you're reporting, all right? When I go in the hazardous waste room, I just throw everything in the box together. I don't even try to separate it. So if you're the one that's doing hazardous waste, 
make sure you're dressed appropriately because this is how you're going to get the stuff. You're going to have to go in there and handle it, break it down. We talked about this. This is about the injuries in the nursing home. And then you should know what the uh, emergency response procedures are. A lot of times you are going to have to notify um, certain people if you have a hazardous waste spill. You have to notify a company that handles this so they can come out with the proper equipment and everything and help you clean it up. So you need to know what the OSHA regulations are and what the procedures for your lab are. And the do you need to call first? Make sure your employee that is exposed is placed in an area where they can't contaminate everybody else. They need a shower, if they need a change of clothes, let's get that going so that we're limiting the exposure to other people. Questions? All right, be careful going home. The life you save might be your own. Oh, you're already home. Why? Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully y'all learned something today. Hopefully you get here most of the lecture. Any questions? Uh, what time is tomorrow's class? Uh, I have to look at the schedule. I don't memorize class times. Hold on. I think it's at 10. No, I'm lying. 730. Oh, my God. I got to be here at 730. I'll be here anyway, probably well before that. Sheesh. OK. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank have you. a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, Miss Loesch. Thank, Thank you. Too. Thank you, Miss Loesch. Thank you. You're welcome.